back to Newsmaker Live with me, Kendall Burton, my special guest this evening, Mondi Lewis and Alicia Ali, two organizers of the I Stand For campaign launched earlier today. We're talking about domestic violence, especially before our break, we were talking about the link between economics and domestic violence, the fact that um, single mothers especially are very vulnerable um, as a result of the economic um, situation or circumstances. Um, if I understand that up to between 15 and 49 years, a um, significant number of women by that time have suffered some form of domestic violence. Um, I'm not sure what the local situation is, but a lot of it has been tied to the economic situation, which makes them vulnerable, makes their children vulnerable, makes them dependent on men who are abusive um, to them. I want to get your reaction on how this uh, situation can be addressed or dealt with. Okay, um, because we know that women are some of the, some, as a group which is most vulnerable mm -hmm. in society, our interventions really need to be targeted for women, for women with children, whatever projects or programs that need to be instituted to safeguard against abuses, to safeguard against um, economic dependence on a man. Um, we need to shape policies and programs which speak to women um, because finances, economics should never be a reason to stay in an abusive relationship. I know it is probably one of the main reasons mm -hmm. that a lot of women, a lot of us stay in relationships, but it doesn't have to be that way. And again, this is where government programming, NGOs, schools, churches, can get involved because a lot of the times within the school the teachers know the students who come from homes where there is um, abuse and if we can tackle it from a community level because I don't expect the government to know every single household mm -hmm. where there is some form of abuse but I expect that um, God forbid, I know the teachers already have so much to deal with that they too have to spot abuses in their classrooms, but this is the reality. And I think that for, for us, whatever campaigns that we design, it has to be targeted to women and to children because we understand that they need special care and attention. And um, for, for any society to really... I suppose to show that level of development, you really have to take care of those who are most vulnerable ar amongst us. Mm -hmm. And our children, there is no greater way that a society can fail than if we do not take care of those who really do not have the ability to take care of themselves. To take it a little bit further, mm -hmm. a lot of our people in our society don't even know when they're being abused because domestic violence is not about just physical assault. Right. You have mental abuse, you have emotional abuse, and you have economic mm -hmm. abuse, which is what mm -hmm. we're alluding to right, right now. But we have to get our people into the habit of being able to identify when they are victims and perpetrators of this abuse. Um, from my experience working um, in the media and with various NGOs, there are times men don't even know when they're economically abusing their spouse. Mm -hmm. And there are times when women don't even know they're being emotionally abused. So again, education is a very big part of this campaign. And as you alluded to earlier, women are not the only victims. At least 10% mm -hmm. of the men are subjected to some form of abuse, whether sexual or otherwise as well. Um, I want to take a look at our third clip uh, for this evening, a story we carried earlier um, tonight about some fifth grade students who threatened to kill a teacher. We'll take a look at that clip and then when I come back, I want to get your reactions. The principal says that the entire class was impacted by the threats and as a result, the school called in the police and the parents of all the students in the grade four class. The two students who made the threats apologized to the teachers, saying that their actions were prompted by anger. Since we are child-friendly school, we thought it necessary to bring in the parents because statements like that impact upon all of us, and especially the young ones within the classroom. So we called this meeting for that purpose, and we invited an officer 
from the Marshall Police Station to speak to the parents about the ramifications of that. And we also had the students, the entire class, at that meeting too. The principal says that, that the two students at the center of the controversy are good performers. However, she says the school has a zero tolerance for violence policy and needed to make that very clear. The school also had to deal with students who were held with match bombs in their possession. When you make threats like that in, in, a, in a classroom, it unsettles the rest of the children. So we wanted the parents to be aware and for them to continue to speak to the children about what they say, what they do. Because, I mean, if we don't do that now, it's going to escalate into things that we cannot control. And I'm sending today a very, very strong message to parents out there. Speak to your children continuously. The students were given a chance to continue classes. The principal says all the good teachers are trying to achieve with students in their care is being undone at home and on the streets. She says that the school has a perennial problem of students lying to their parents and has appealed to all parents to continue to monitor their children. Ironically, shortly after the threats were made against the female teacher, another teacher reported having to dodge a bottle that was thrown in her direction by a student. The bottle smashed into a wall and broke into pieces. But the student who threw it claimed another student, and not the teacher, was the intended target. Reporting for the DBS News World, I am Cecil Actel. Your reaction? Wow. Um, uh, um, kudos to the principal, first of all, for the way that she handled that situation mm -hmm. and the advice that she gave to parents out there. Our children, our society. Um, in this instance, I think a lot of care and attention needs to be brought to these students mm -hmm. and probably to the school as a whole. And this has to go throughout our education system. I think there is a need uh, for the continuous conflict resolution classes mm -hmm. and um, really advocating a better way to deal with our uh, outbursts, to deal with our anger. Because I understand that we as people have very short tempers. I have a very short temper. I get very antsy. Oh, really? <laughs> I get very antsy. Um, mm. I have a very low tolerance for a lot of things, but as a person, even in this campaign, mm. in my personal life, I'm getting help dealing with that. And it is, I think we should come to a place in society that, you know, we, we're able, like Alicia said, to admit that we do have a problem. We have a problem in our society that we are very intolerant of a lot of things. And we think that it is okay to lash out. And... I'm saying this to myself right now, that is not okay mm -hmm. to lash out. And you know where experts can come in and help, therapists, psychologists can come and talk to students because this is deeper than what a teacher said to a student that he would threaten to kill right. her. This is... And there are a lot more issues Yeah, going there are a lot of that issues is and that question. needs to be right. explored and yes. somebody needs and probably... Maybe it was a good thing that this happened mm -hmm. and that, that this child can now get some attention and somebody can really explore ways in the which... underlying causes. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, this is what we're lacking in our society and in our schools. We children have deal with a lot at home and they need an avenue to release that, whether it be by drawing, by talking, by dancing, by singing, which is why, again, after-school programs are so important because it gives students and avenue away from the classes to really express themselves and I suppose to be themselves and not in homes which are possibly broken homes which are unattended and um, I think one way for that is the after school programs and also really getting expert help within the school system and identifying students and even those who don't say much mm -hmm. to get them to talk to get them to express themselves in writing and in drawing things that are affecting them. Though we may have been shocked at the incident itself, the, the statements that the students made, the bigger question is why? Why are they so angry to lash out in that particular manner? You know, why is it 
that they have all this anger bottled up inside and that is how they choose to release it what is going on with them and it, these are the bigger questions and the more profound questions that sometimes we have to admit that we really don't want the answers to because when we get those answers they will be unpleasant and then we may not have the solutions at hand right away. But these are the things the I Stand Against campaign would like to bring to the fore. The bigger question of why. Why do we behave in the way that we do? Uh, we remember uh, Dr. Morella Joseph and the incident in 1998. Right. Why did that student feel it necessary to lash out in that manner to commit such a horrendous crime against his teacher? These are the questions that we really need to bring to the fore, and not as an I stand against campaign, but as individuals, as parents. Parents, I find nowadays, are quite defensive when it comes to their children. Their children can do no wrong. Their children should not be corrected. And I think we need to take a step back. And as a parent myself, um, when I get a complaint about my son at school, I say, okay, well, what did he do? How did, how did the incident happen? Okay, what was his role in it? How did you handle it? Mm -hmm. Because obviously we feed off each other's energies. If you are very rambunctious with me, I may respond in the very same way. Mm -hmm. So we transfer those sort of energies. So that is where we have to see our society going. And we don't need a campaign to tell us that. We don't need a campaign. There's no manual to parenting. But there are certain things that we need to recognize, that if an incident like this happens, yes, you may be upset that your child behaved in that way, mm -hmm. and you want to punish him or her for behaving in that way, but find it within yourself to do the investigation as to why that child behaved and responded to conflict in that manner. You're watching Newsmaker Live on DBS Television. The lines are open. You're free to call us with your questions and comments. Um, our guests tonight, Alicia Ali and Mondi Lewis, the organizers of the I Stand For campaign launched earlier today with a silent march through the streets of Castries. As you touched on earlier, um, children learn a lot more by looking at us than anything that we, we say to them. Um, speaking of parents, one of the stories that DBS and a lot of the other media have been carrying is a situation that developed at St. Mary's College, a dispute between the principal of that school and the parent of a student at the school over a hairstyle. Um, the parent has relented, but she has indicated that she is willing to pursue other options, including legal options. We want to look at that clip uh, a little in a little bit, but we have a call, so let's go to that call and then we can do that afterwards. Good evening, you're on Newsmaker Live. Mr. KB, good night. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. What's your contribution tonight? Yeah, and um, good night to your your guests. Good Inu night. Manuel, please. Good night. I think I have known these two young mm -hmm. ladies for a while, um, Mondi and Alicia, and I am very proud of them. And um, I believe that um, we need more persons to avoid the the talking avoid staying on the on the sideline and come into the water, come and serve your country. And you see the um the notion of people saying to you all that will die. I have heard that that song being being sung when I started my my feeding program. And I'm proud to see that um come January I'll be celebrating seven years, you know? Congratulations. You know Congrats. Um, yeah, my advice to you all is that um, you only need to try to get a uh, a young man with integrity to come between you all to bring a little balance <laughs> because you know watching you all there as to as to women i think we need a, a young man to bring a little a little balance to the organization are you volunteering uh, i think i have um <laughs> i have played my my role in society and i'm of age you know mm. oh no you as young as you feel <laughs> but i will be on my knees praying for you all because i'm um, you all need um praise and, and guidance you all need mm. that um that spiritual guidance and um you all will get um challenges the road wouldn't be easy monday you all will get um speed bumps you all will get roadblocks but you all need to stand firm you all, you all, you all need to be strong you all need to um to level criticism at governments as long as it is constructive you know because um people in, in authority will will test you all to see how strong you all are you know but once you all know that the 
the cause is a is a just cause. You know, you know, you all me, you, you, you all will be threatened because that movement, you know, it will it will mushroom, and I'm prophesying now, it will mushroom into into something great. You know, I you know when I see all I see the the daughters of of, of Martin Luther King. Mm. You know, so I want to wish you all on all the best, and I'm I I I hear your aunt asking for um for questions concerning the um the incident at the Marshall School, and these things you know these things are are very deep. You know these things you know the the children some of them cannot you know attend classes because they have nothing to eat. You see, and they've seen others you know wasting. Why they haven't got nothing to eat? They seen others, you know, who who have large amount. And, and and today I was saying, but to me, why it is so that you have you have one set who have everything, and you have others who who have nothing, and those who have everything not looking out. And I, I think that those people in society who have, I think it is time to to release because we all we we all have solutions. We are branded as a, as a Christian society, and yet still we have excess, even in the churches. I mean, you see a sister going to church with the, you know, coming to church with the, the, same, the same dress every Sunday. Something in you not telling you that you have to do something about it. You have to wait for her to come and tell you when things are rough. And that is the kind of awareness. We need to bring back the, the, the olden days. Be each other's keeper. And in, and in, and in doing these things, we will have a a better and brighter solution. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. God no. bless you too. Yeah. No, he brought them yeah. two issues which I, I think are great. The need for a young man. Yes. And I will say that, you know, some of our biggest supporters and biggest cheerleaders are indeed young men. Um, we have a shout out Kim at this point in time. Yes, and he has really, he has agreed to really come on board with us to really develop this campaign mm -hmm. into something beneficial. And even Nick Louie, who has been there with us, and Scatty.p, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, we've gotten some tremendous support from young mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. because they too are tired of seeing young women abused and, um, you know, and funny enough, Mondi and I had this discussion yes, uh, yesterday or a few days ago. I said to her, you know, we need some testosterone to balance all this estrogen, <laughs> you know, just to make sure that we, if we're saying this is an all-encompassing campaign, we need to make it all-encompassing. We cannot presume to know all the issues the male gender faces. Um, it's just when you say, when you have people planning youth activities, you plan activities for young people and not one young person is on the organizing committee uh, we are not going to presume to know mm. what our male counterparts the challenges that they are facing we want to hear it firsthand we want it from their perspective so that was already ticked off our list and crossed out okay. yes. well let's go to that uh, final and fourth clip for this evening with the St. Mary's College incident and then we come back and get your reactions The mother of the child says after a very long discussion with her son and relevant parties, she has decided to cover her son's hair in keeping with the wishes of St. Mary's College to allow him to attend classes and take part in school activities. The principal of the college says he's pleased with the development. We welcome him back to the fold, you might say, of the, of the school and he's in class. I'm sure learning well and doing well and being happy as the other boys. The boys gave him a round of applause when he came in this morning. Although we did have a very rousing assembly this morning, everybody reaffirming the position of the school, very, very known certain terms. But at the end of the day, it's good that this has happened, so he can now join the school and be one of us. It's what we wanted all along, you know. He's, a, I think, a very pleasant young man, very polite, who has much going for him. We like to be a part of his growth and development. Bibiana Williams, the mother of the child at the center of the controversy, had insisted she would not cut or cover her child's hair or transfer him from St. Mary's College. The college said the mother had agreed in writing to the school's rules. The standoff had resulted in her 12-year-old son being prevented from attending formal classes at the institution. People have the right to object as they as they see fit, but there's a, there's a way to do things, you know. Sitting at the expense of the children, you don't use the child to make your point, you know. You, you can make your point otherwise, um, but let the child get what's best for him. That's his chance in the classroom. 
along the way you can see about these things. And we we open to suggestions and recommendations and so on. It's a dynamic school where things change. We recognize that, but there are ways to change things and ways that you don't try to change things by upsetting the entire apple cart of the school. St. Mary's College says it already has six students who grow their hair, but keep it covered. It had accused the mother at the center of the hair controversy of being stubborn, insisting she and the child had a problem with the hair covering. However, while agreeing to cover her son's hair in the interim, Bibiana Williams made it clear that she is pursuing legal and other avenues to see that the St. Mary's College rule is abolished. As far as she is concerned, the hair rule is tantamount to discrimination. According to her, there is no evidence to suggest that uncovered, plaited hair results in chaos, as stated by the school principal. She says boys attending school with braided hair is fairly new, but the breakdown of school discipline has been going on for far longer, so the true cause of the situation needs to be identified. Ms. Williams says from an infant, her son has been instilled with the right values of discipline, hard work, respect for self, and respect for elders as well as love for everyone. According to her, these were values that mattered in him obtaining a 93.67 pass mark at the common entrance examinations, and his splatted hair had no bearing on the values instilled in him as a child. Reporting for the DBS News World, I am Cecil Actil. I want to get your reaction to that story, especially in light of some of the criticisms or comments that have been made in reaction to the story. Um, some suggesting that the flagrant disregard for rules is what contributes to the, dis the indiscipline and the breakdown in the society and by extension some of the violence that we're experiencing. Do you see it that way or do you see it as a mother who's just reacting to what she really thinks is her son being um, discriminated against? Um, I am first of all very happy that the young man went back to classes mm -hmm. and that's very important and in as adults no matter our beliefs or our persuasions um, at the end of the day um, his education is paramount mm -hmm. so I think the one um, thing should have always been to get him back to class and now that this is done I think all the other avenues can be explored so going to court and finding other ways to address um, the rule of the school I think that can be handled now that he is back in school and the school has the position which I suppose needs to be respected but of course every day we need to to challenge our systems our institutions especially when we are so persuaded or when we believe that our rights are being infringed upon but I will always say that with rights there are responsibilities and we can never negate that fact so, um, Ms. Williams has the right to, I suppose, seek redress in any way that she feels fit. And the school also has a right to uphold what they believe is key for the institution to, to survive throughout the years. For me, some rules are meant to be bent, some are meant to be broken, and some are meant to be abolished altogether. From my perspective, I can understand both the school's standpoint and the mother's standpoint. But I believe that really uh, keeping the young man out of class for that long, for me that was one of the things that really upset me. Because here he is, he has these two people fighting over him mm -hmm. and he's sitting down and he just wants to go to class. And he should never have been deprived of that. The better way should have been found to handle that. As to whether St. Mary's is right in, in its, its rule, whether it's discrimination as the mother sees it, we have to leave that up for a legal system. I don't purport to be an attorney or anything close to an attorney. Right. So whether that, law, that rule is discriminating or not, that is up to the court. However, I do believe that, again, this did not have to to reach such catastrophic proportions. It could have been dealt with differently on both parts. And these are the things that we need to look at. When this young man sees this going on and all, he's an innocent bystander, he has plots in his head, he just wants to go to class, wants to be with his friends, he's coming to a new school, it's SMC, and he's not allowed to participate in the class jokes and, and all that camaraderie, build that bond with his fellow classmates. He very well might have become the brunt of the jokes. As a result, yeah. uh, well, 
even that may have been the case, but there would have been that camaraderie that a lot of um, college boys they, and a lot of Sumerians, that's, that's what they cherish along mm -hmm. the line. And he should not have been robbed of that opportunity. Okay. Let's go back to violence generally. And we want to remind our callers, the lines are open. You can call us with your questions or comments. We're speaking with Felicia Ali and Mondi Lewis, the two organizers of the I Stand For campaign launched earlier today. Do you feel that the police have been sufficiently well trained to deal with domestic violence, whether it is perpetrated against a man or a woman. Are they sensitive enough? That is one of the biggest criticisms against our law enforcement officers. Well, I can speak from experience, as I mentioned earlier. Being a, v a victim of domestic violence myself, I can say when I did call the police, they did go above and beyond um, to assist. It may have been a, a change in policy or a change in the mindset or change in the protocols that they have, but I have been working with a lot of NGOs and we have had, especially working with the St. Lucia Crisis Center, we have had victims who say, well, the police are, are insensitive, uh, you know, they write it off as just a, a household matter, something that needs to be dealt with behind closed doors. There, it, I think it really depends on who is attending to the matter and it should not be the case there should be an overall policy where we take domestic violence very seriously because in st lucia and if you look at the crime statistics domestic violence accounts for most of the homicides the rapes um and the harm cases that we have so we need to recognize that domestic violence needs to be addressed from a policing standpoint the law enforcement standpoint um, so i'm not certain how as a as a policy maker at this point, the government can emphasize the need mm -hmm. or even the hierarchy of the police force can emphasize the need for police officers when they get the domestic violence calls for them to treat it as serious as they would any murder investigation or any drug bust. Okay, we have another call. Good evening, caller. You're on the air. Good evening. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Okay. I, um, I just wanted to say that um, I was listening to the presentation by the young lady on the matter of the young man and his hair mm -hmm. and how it affected his education and um, I beg to differ in terms of whether the young man was kept out of school. The only person who made that decision to keep him out of school was his mother. The, the young man is, is um, a young man belonging to a mother and the mother said she wanted her son to be in school without the head and she decided that if he did not go to school with his head uh, uncovered, then she had no difficulty in him staying out of the school. The school has its rules, mm -hmm. and the rules were known, and these are facts. The facts are the mother knew the rules of the school before she sent her son there. The facts are that the, the, the principal of the school gave the option of how to, to, to participate in the school. So the principal never denied the young man access to the school. He said access to the school is based on the following conditions, which were known in advance. Now, the issue of discrimination, I have a grave problem with this, you see, mm -hmm. because the school rules are there for everyone. It is not discriminating. It is there for every student. So it does not discriminate one against the other. So in my humble opinion, Today the issue is headdress. Tomorrow it might be the color of the pants, black or blue. So let us say another mother arrives at college tomorrow morning and she says, I want my son to go to school with a pair of jeans. This is his right. So what do we do? We abandon the school uniform and we succumb to the mothers because the next argument would be, how does his pants affect him uh, learning? Mm -hmm which was the argument made about the hair. Right. So tomorrow morning we turn up and we say, I want to go with a t-shirt. Sure, we'll go with a t-shirt. And you go to court for a t-shirt. It's right to wear a t-shirt. Where does it end? I think we must really be careful that we do not put individual rights at above group rights. I believe if you examine every society that has developed, and you can go to the, the Far East, look at the Japanese, look at the Chinese, they understand the meaning of order. They understand. Look at Singapore, the country we talk about all the time as a model. Order. No chewing of gum 
on a train. Everybody has a right to chew gum, but it's against the law to chew gum on a train mm -hmm. because it has caused deaths in the past. So the point I'm making here is it's, it's, it's convenient sometimes to talk about individual rights, but I think perhaps we must really reconsider the issue of what is the collective and what works in the best interest of the collective. And, and in the case of the young man at the college, in my humble opinion, I think the mother knew the rules in advance. I think the college has had its tradition of how it conducts itself, and that is important also. It's important. Mm -hmm. Tradition is important. And therefore, if the mother do not want her son to conform with the rules, she perhaps should not have had him there. That's my humble opinion. Thank you. Thanks for your call. Anyway, you care to respond to that? Well, I mean, as I was saying, I, as I said, mm -hmm. I can understand both the principal and the mother's point of view. I still stand by what I said. The mm -hmm. boy was robbed of his first few days of school, mm -hmm. um, his first few weeks, and that should have n not been the case at all. You are putting him in the position of disobeying his mother, which is something we are not trying to encourage mm -hmm. um, but at the same time he was in a precarious position he was in a position that he should not have been put in right. and so the argument was between two adults and it should have stayed on that level okay we have another caller good evening caller good night i'd uh, like to add my two cents to this controversy which controversy um from a mother's perspective are you speaking about the hair controversy yes yeah. Uh, bear in mind, we're also here to discuss the I Stand For campaign and domestic violence and some of the other ills affecting okay, the society. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that as well. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I think in the first and foremost is the mother denied this child of his education for two or three weeks. There is the thing of um, when it comes to um, there was um, when you go to the school for um, to register. Okay? I am positive sure, 100% sure, the rules were given to her. She signed on the dotted line. You know, you sign the document knowing that there were rules and regulations. The whole of this thing is the timing of what she wants to, to, to make of it right now. She could, have, she could have talked about it from at the time when she went to register this child and said, look, my son have been from age whatever have been wearing his hair like this i am not in agreement but you don't sign something and after the fact send the child to school on that day and behaving you are the boss and is what i say goes if there is anybody who prevented this child from his education the first and foremost is the mother okay okay i'm talking as a mother where i had young children going to school and where they wanted, like my daughter when she was going to secondary school, wanted the, the uniform shorter than what was stipulated on the rules. Mm -hmm. I stood my ground and said there was a requirement of the length of the skirt supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I'm going no shorter. It may be longer, but not shorter. <laughs> so we as parents, because if we continue letting these things go, the morals of breakdown in society, it will continue. Tomorrow, more than a, hair, a, a hairdo will, will come up in any other school. When will we cut it off? You know, so the mother, I think she, she needs to sit down and let her son know, apologize. You are never too big or because you are a mother that you cannot apologize to your children. I have done it to my children where I figured as a mother that I should have been taking the bulls by the horn. Mm -hmm. And when I realized, hey, it's not about me. It's about my children. What do I have to do? I, I had to apologize to them. So I think this mother, Mrs. Miss, Miss or Mrs. Williams, she should sit down and rethink this thing and apologize to her son. Okay? Now, next topic, <laughs> domestic violence. Kendall, I am 100% against domestic violence in all forms. Mm -hmm. Not only against women. Men are being, domestic, uh, are being violated as well. I am 100% I am against it, whether man or woman. And any woman who is in a relationship, as long as you start seeing the red flags, the last red flags, you need to run far, mm -hmm. stay far, because it will happen a little slap, tomorrow it will be worse than a slap. It happened once, it will happen again. 
when you start seeing these red flags, there's nothing to say, oh, I think he or she will change. What has he or she done to make changes? Did you go to counseling? You know, there's so many things you could do. But just by saying, oh, I'm sorry? No, we heard that story over and over. And the story, you know what, does end up death. So I'm against violence in all forms, male or female. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much for your call. Thank you for your well, as you quite rightly said earlier, some people who are in those situations don't understand that they are um, victims of domestic violence. Some of them grew up um, in households where they saw it, and that is their norm, or what is normal for them. Um, so they think there's nothing wrong with, with what, what it, um, I'm going through. I've heard it said before, and I've experienced it. Um, some women, female friends of mine, have actually said to me, if he didn't love me, he wouldn't beat me. Yes, we've heard that yeah. quite a lot. And people gauge their partners um, love for them by how often they get beaten. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Mandy? Um, yes, um, for sure. Um, this also goes to another aspect of which the campaign will also try to address. Mm -hmm. um, our institutions which provide health services. So we say that, health you know, services. yes, okay. um, and it, it's mental health, your mm -hmm. overall wo well-being. Mm -hmm. I think it is important for our services, for new protocols to be put in place. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to care of persons, there needs to be um, a differentiated service when it comes to men and when it comes to women, because sometimes we're all not comfortable, or I suppose men are not comfortable going to speak to women, perhaps, or maybe or the female psychologist. Mm -hmm. You know, because I suppose you know the whole macho thing, or or even probably just not. I mean, it might be the other way around. Yes, or maybe the other way around. Maybe they're more comfortable speaking to women yeah. as opposed to speaking to men. So we need to find out which one is the right balance, which one is the right fit, because we need to get people to actually... First, we need to make the services available mm -hmm. for people so that they know that there is a place that they can walk into and that there is confidentiality. We understand that our society is a small one, but it doesn't have to reach a place that before you walk into an office or an institution, the rest of Castries yes. knows right. what... Oh, honey, in this day and age, there's a BlackBerry broadcast message going out mm -hmm. or a WhatsApp mm -hmm. broadcast. Right. Yes, it doesn't have to, to be that way. So confidentiality is a problem when it comes to your mental health, when it comes to you getting tested, when it comes to you just seeking advice or asking a question. That is important, I think, and a lot of people shy away from such services or such interventions because they do not feel that what they say or what they do or what they're going through would remain there. And that is something that we need to first, we need to get the services, mm -hmm. and then we need to ensure that um, people take advantage of the services. People take advantage of, people Especially feel comfortable to take, care, mm -hmm. to, um, to take advantage of the services. Well, there are some, there's a semblance of some of these services here in St. Lucia. And as yeah. I say, a semblance. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that the family court is overwhelmed. Their social workers, their social workers also provide therapy. Uh, we do have human services that mm -hmm. have, again, social workers, uh, but they're, again, they're understaffed. And the social workers are taking care of the entire island at human services. Right. In a population of 170,000 people, I don't think a handful of social workers is adequate. So one of the things we really have to look at is our young people that are going out there to study mm -hmm. uh, medicine and law is that we, we usually push our children into those careers right. from very small and we say, oh, I want you to be a lawyer. Is that really what that child wants to be? What if that child may have an inclination to be a humanitarian or to relate better but with... Ah, it also comes to, um, you know, a policy mm -hmm. direction, you know, what yeah, exactly... What, the yes. needs. what exactly right. is our priority list looking right. for? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. What exactly are students being provided with loans and what, mm -hmm. what so sort of more social scholarships? Workers, more forensic scientists. Exactly, because mm -hmm. I'm... I and then when we have that priority list, but when they come home, what are they coming home to? But... Right. I guess, again, I suppose the big um, issue is funding mm -hmm. for all of these things, but um, it's a need. And um, I know that, you know, somebody was telling me about, you know, the uh, Cuba system mm -hmm. where they have a social worker for every how many hundred people mm -hmm. in the population. And I'm not saying that um, this is something that we cannot do. It's something that has to be done because the way that our society is going for, I don't think that tears 
matches or anything can heal when a family is broken so prevention preventative measures if it means right. training more people i think as a country we need to set the priorities okay we have another call let's take that call good evening caller good evening and good evening to your guests good evening I'm just calling to make a to put in my two cents hmm. um there are a few things which i've heard and i i do know that they are at best inaccurate First and foremost, we will speak of discrimination. Mm. Could it possibly be that that rule was put in place rather for inclusion rather than discrimination? Mm. Because one would look at it, okay, we need standardization. We need to ensure that individuals in schools are not going to detract. I remember as a student at the Cassius Conference in secondary school, um, a young lady came to school one day and her skirt had a split in it. And that was back in about 1987. Mm. And not much of anything. I mean, probably just about three inches. Mm. Let me tell you, that got us, the guys, going all over the place. Okay. I mean, she had to go and get that split out. It wasn't much. It was just something short. But it looked different. Mm -hmm. And I suppose as young men in such a school, we were moved by that. <laughs> so one must realize that uniform is there for standardization and to prevent detractions in any form whatsoever. Right. Secondly, we, we keep on talking about the young man being denied an education. I think we need to qualify that. We may say that the young man was probably denied an academic education. But school is not just about academic instruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's about social education as well. It's about civics. It's about moral instruction. It's about spiritual instruction, especially at a school like St. Mary's College. And when we keep on saying the boy was denied an education, denied an education, denied an education, that is not so. He learned quite a lot. And furthermore, it is inaccurate to state that he was put out of class. This young man was in class for well over a week at the school before a letter was issued, and then he was put out of class, if you want to say put out of class. So the people are giving the impression that from day one, he was never in a classroom. That is not the case. Even before day one, the rules were known, the mother knew the rules, they all knew the rules. In spite of that, Mr. Sion, I have it from good grounds, allowed him in the classroom for well over a week, trying to get everyone to be on board with the rules and regulations. But it seems people are not getting on board, so he had to take stronger action. If words alone are not going to do it, you have to move, you have to act. I also think it is inaccurate to state that it's Mr. Sion's rules against the mother. It's not. Mr. Sion represents the institution. Mr. Sion represents 123 years of St. Mary's College. That's what he represents. It's not Mr. Sion against the mother. It's not Mr. Sion's rule. It's the rules of the St. Mary's College. It's the rules of the board. It's the rules of the church. It's the rules of 123 years of tradition. That is what it is. People speak about the school archaic rules backwards. My dear goodness, in the last five years, look at the password of St. Mary's College, this archaic school, this backward school. Its password has been moving 93%, 95%, this year 96% plus. I know the boy got 93. As a school, St. Mary's College got 96%. As a body, and we have one individual coming in, 93%. Okay? But it's an archaic school, I must admit that. Maybe those old rules are not working. If they were working, St. Mary's probably would be at maybe, what, 60% like most other schools are? Maybe that is what we want. The rules make St. Mary's what it is. And to go about changing the rules, are we saying that 97% approximate for St. Mary's College is not what we want? Let us break down the institution. Let us do away with this little rule and move on to others and bring it down. Okay, Carla. Let's move on to other things. Yes. Thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that um, it seems this is... This controversy seems more important than the issue at hand. Okay, let's get back on track. <laughs> yes. Now, we were talking earlier about your own experience and the mm -hmm. fact that you, you were happy with the treatment that you got. Could it not have been that you got that treatment because of who you are and who you're associated with? That may very well be the case, yeah. um, but I guess we'll not know at this point. Yeah, hold on, I thought. Good evening, caller. Hello. Yeah. Hi, ah, you're on the Hello? air. Hello. Yeah, man, I'm going to be brief, you know. Thank you. I want to know, who is St. Mary? That is the first thing. And who is this, this, this principal in 
got they got to push this pushing this kind of nonsense. What kind of crazy thing is going? Who's paying him anyway? Okay, caller. Thank you very much for being very brief. Uh, we do for another break. We'll take that break, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Alicia Ali and Mondi Lewis, the two organizers behind the I Stand campaign launched earlier today. We'll be right back.